Assalamualaikum, peace be upon you all. All thanks and praise is due to God. We seek God's help and forgiveness. We seek refuge in God from the evil within ourselves and the consequences of our evil deeds. Whoever God guides will never be led astray, and whoever God allows to go astray will never find guidance. I bear witness there is no God but God, alone with no partners, and I bear witness that Muhammad is God's servant and God's messenger. You who believe, be mindful of God as is God's due, and make sure you devote yourself to God to your dying moment. Quran 3, 102. Okay. Wow. Um, I'll be real with you. Uh, I never thought that I would be able to be a part of such an incredible group. It's truly humbling, and I thank you all for entrusting me with your attention, hopefully, today. Putting today, um, Putting together today's khutbah was admittedly difficult. I can stand up here and act like this was an easy experience, but I'm not great at pretending. We Muslims live in a world where our very existence is so frequently considered to be a footnote. Our reality is pushed to the side until we are considered interesting enough to be covered. Let me explain where I come from in all of this. I'm Syrian and Danish, the oldest in a family of eight children. I was born in Denmark and spent the first six years of my life living in Japan. I still remember learning when, like, I still remember learning the moment that we were going to be moving to the United States. I was at my friend's house and we were watching Winnie the Pooh. Does anyone here remember the original show? Okay, good. <laughs> Well, they used to play Winnie the Pooh in Japanese. And so I'm sitting there happily with my friends watching some episode when my friend's mother asked me if I wanted to hear what my new language would sound like. You can imagine that I probably wasn't too excited. I really wasn't. So she puts it on. She didn't listen to me. And the words that came out sounded so coarse, so hard to understand. So yes. I wasn't the most thrilled six-year-old to move to the United States. I went to public school in America for two years, proud of being Muslim. Suddenly though, in second grade, my friends stopped wanting to talk to me. It wasn't until almost a decade and a half later, when I was in my junior year of college, that I learned that people stopped talking to me not because of who I was, but because they found out that my mama and myself were Muslim. So I grew up homeschooled, my best friends, my sisters, and my brothers. That can be really difficult to deal with, especially when you just want a friend to hang out with. I found my escape in books because my mama loved collecting books, especially a lot of books that included and shared those stories of the prophet, peace be upon him, and his companions, may God be pleased with them. That's when I first found my role models. Their stories, realities, and lives have the ability to connect with us in ways that might not always be expected. One of my biggest role models growing up was the Prophet's beloved daughter, Fatima, may God be pleased with her. She refused to let those around her push her into any boxes, standing for the rights for all in need, a fact of her life since she was very young. There's a reason the most well-known story of Fatima embodies her fearlessness in the face of those trying to push her father, faith, and personal life into nothing more than a footnote in history. As a young girl, she visited the Masjid al-Haram with the Prophet Muhammad. As he began to pray, a group of Quraysh gathered around him. A member of the clan fetched the remains of a slaughtered animal, the guts and the gross parts, and threw it on the shoulders of the prophet while he was pr prostrating. Prostrating. <laughs> Everyone has one of those, but not that one. Okay. Fatima, however, did not stand back. She removed the filth from her father and angrily lashed out at the enemies. She was unwilling to stay silent in the face of oppression, no matter how many people stood up against her. This brings me to the message behind today's khutbah, or lecture, as it is now. The world is ours to take, so what are we waiting for? Our very existence, our very thriving, is the ultimate form of resistance. As we sit together in this room, think back to a moment in which you felt silenced, broken, 
simply alone. Regardless of whether or not we have ever publicly admitted it, we have all battled through such moments or could still be battling through such a moment right now. For me, one of those moments happened during my last year at Wellesley College. I was majoring in psychology and had spent hours and hours working for professors to make sure that it didn't matter what stood in my way after I graduated, that I would be able to pursue my dreams of being a psychology professor and researcher. Also, my parents told me that psychology was a horrible major, so I wanted to prove them wrong. <laughs> they deny that they ever said that now. <laughs> it didn't cross my mind that my faith and the way I chose to practice it could have any impact on my dreams until the day it did. It was an educational trip down to South Carolina to observe the school systems there, and I had applied for the program. The professor immediately emailed me, admitting me to the program before even bringing me in for an interview. You're beyond qualified, I remember reading. I'd love to have you participate in the program. I received an email from her several days later, requesting my appearance in her office. I wasn't sure why she called this meeting, but I made the trip up the well-worn stairwell to the building her office was in. When I look back now, I feel foolish for my younger self's misplaced optimism. My naivete feels me, fills me with sorrow when I think about the girl that I was, the girl I'd lose within the space of half an hour. I have to tell you, the professor fidgeted the slightest bit in her chair. We've had such a diverse set of students come down south on this trip, but of course, sometimes certain precautions must be taken. I sat there nodding, unsure of what, where she was going about this. Was this some sort of welcome to the program? At my school, anything goes. Um, unfortunately, she continued, unable to meet my gaze for more than a few seconds, I did have to tell the principal of the school about your, she gestured at my head and I froze. This, I fingered the fringe of my scarf stupidly as she went on. He's very uncomfortable having you come down because you know, she gestured vaguely. Know what? What was it? I'd heard countless accounts of discrimination happening to women wearing the head covering, even here at Wellesley, but this couldn't be one of them. It wouldn't be one of them. Can we do anything about this? I asked. I remember the moment she suggested that I take off the head covering in order to participate in the program. The numbness that crept over me as I saw my ambitions crumble in one fell swoop. I left her office in a state of shock after being paid off with a funded research internship with her. I remember her reluctant handshake, head shake, her saying, I'm so sorry, when I refused to take off my scarf. Her apology was full of sorrow, not at the circumstances, but at my failure to give in. I met my first year roommate, a strong-willed, agnostic, Polish immigrant woman, on the ramp up to the student center later that day. <clears throat> In the days I recounted what had just happened, there was nothing I could do, was there? Her fury at the professor's decision threw things into perspective. You can't accept this. Her anger was palpable, validating the tears filling my eyes. We have to do something about this. My mother reacted similarly. Leila, you idiot. <laughs> Don't just let this go. We'll sue the professor. We'll sue the college. Picture a Danish woman screaming into the phone. Yeah, that was my mom. Suddenly, things shifted into sharp focus. Where naivete around my future once existed, defiance bloomed. You can make it through. It thrummed through me when a fellow underrepresented student careless, carelessly dismissed my experience. It stilled my shaking fingers when I dialed the college president's office. The student who answered my call told me I wouldn't be able to meet with President Bottomley for months. And in that moment, my anger at being stripped of the chance to thrive, all because of my choice to wear the head covering, brimmed over. I said, can you let her know that next year, the college should note in the course catalog, students with headscarves need not apply? Within 24 hours, <laughs> I was readmitted to the program and given profuse apologies from every dean at the college. The professor remained confused as to my reaction. 
Within 24 hours, I learned that to thrive would be an act of survival. It's a reality that we all have dealt with, continue to deal with on sometimes a daily basis. It's something that Fatima dealt with and she hadn't even hit puberty yet. To me, she was the living embodiment of a fierce woman, full of empathy and compassion, but unable to stay quiet in the face of those who threatened her father and her existence. One particularly amazing story happened while the Prophet and his family were still living in Mecca, having to deal with oppression by the Quraysh on a daily basis. So the story goes, <clears throat> once Fatima passed by Abu Jahl bin Hisham, one of the Prophet's most vocal enemies on the street. So she's just walking, living her life, and he passes him. And he, for no reason, slapped her across the face. She went to Abu Sufyan, the leader of the Quraysh, who was not Muslim at the time, and complained to him about Abu Jahl's uncivilized behavior. Abu Sufyan took her with him to the place where Abu Jahl was still sitting and told her to slap him in exactly the same way as he had done, and she did it. When she went home and narrated this incident to the Prophet Muhammad, he was very pleased at Abu Sufyan's sense of justice and righteous action, all because Fatima decided to speak up for what was right. The Prophet then prayed that Abu Sufyan should accept Islam as the true religion. His supplications for Abu Sufyan were accepted, and Abu Sufyan finally swore allegiance to Allah, God, and his Prophet Muhammad, and this was all before Fatima even turned 10. Why am I so in love with this story? You have a young girl who, when she was physically assaulted by one of the largest enemies of her father, took that humiliation and anger to the leader of the tribe. She didn't let it break her. That is an unapologetic stance against forces of evil that continues to stand true hundreds of years later. Her actions are a stark reminder for you and me that it really doesn't matter how much space we might be taking up in the world, that we have the right to demand equal rights and protections for ourselves and for everyone around us. Fatima could have let Abu Jahl silence and break her down, but her choice in seeking justice with a bit of vengeance, I'm not gonna lie, is something that will never fall out of relevance regardless of what year it is. We're all living proof here and now that Fatima's experiences and story mattered, that her refusal to back down in the face of ignorance, oppression, and bullying, even as a young woman, was woven into a faith that continues to thrive hundreds of years later. We live in a world today where it's easier to break people into groups that get smaller and smaller until the only person that you can identify with is yourself. No longer is the earth considered safe for all to walk on because it's easier for those in power to tell us that we deserve less than those around us. That the pie is not meant for everyone to eat. So time is spent convincing vulnerable humans that they deserve just a small piece of the pie. That marginalization is safer than feeling uncomfortable by the differences that we all inherit and carry. That the silence of underrepresented people is much more aesthetically pleasing than having diverse, enriching conversations and discussions among all. But that's exactly why I'm here today. Amidst all of the conflicting messages, the so-called fake news, the daily stories that make us feel like curling up in a corner and just giving up, I'm here to tell you that it will be okay. Throwing it back to my younger self, struggling to figure out the world and what it meant to be seen as other, regardless of how much I believe that I fit in. I made a vow to myself as a teenager that if I ever had the power, the ability to do something about it, that I would make sure that no woman or girl ever felt silenced, censored, or othered. It was a vow that I carried close to my heart throughout my time growing up, and it's the reason that I founded The Tempest, fighting against the current political, social, and cultural climates both here and abroad to build a global media company with more than a thousand women sharing their stories and taking up their space in the world, no apologies attached. It's a journey that I honestly never thought I'd fully embark on a few years ago, but weirdly enough, 
I believe it's something I've always wanted to do deep down inside, even as a girl struggling to fit in at her school in upstate New York. I could bite my tongue and tell you it's all been sunshine and happy days, but hey, that's not who I am. The moments in which I face the decisions to take the easy path, to get out of the work that I do with my startup, to just do something else, have been many, but I continue to choose the difficult route. I'm stubborn, I guess you can say that much. And there's something infinitely terrifying and powerful about almost letting yourself free fall, putting your full trust in God that no matter what, you're here, you're fighting hard, and it's work that you renew your intentions for on a daily basis. I've had days where I sit and cry, unsure of what I even signed up for, only to be followed by small reminders and successes that help me refocus on my ultimate goal with the Tempest. At the end of the day, we're all pushing through life together. It may feel at times that you're alone, that you're battling to get to where you want to be without anyone next to you. That's a daily reality for me as an entrepreneur, so I can tell you it definitely happens. But there's a beauty to it, as raw and difficult as that beauty may be to recognize among the, diff the difficult and rough moments. God is always there. Regardless of what you're dealing with, I've found that during times in which I feel like I just can't breathe anymore, when I close my laptop, walk outside, sit in the grass, and just breathe, then simply talking to God, I've been able to regain trust in myself. God and God's infinite knowledge and mercy continues to remind us, us of that fact in Surah Al-Baqarah, literally in the last verse, so verse 286. God does not burden any human being with more than they are well able to bear. In their favor shall be whatever good they do, and against them whatever evil they do. O oh, our sustainer, take us not to task if we forget or unwittingly do wrong. O oh, our sustainer, lay not upon us a burden such as thou didst lay upon those who lived before us. O oh, our sustainer, make us not bear burdens which we have no strength to bear. And efface thou our sins and grant us forgiveness and bestow thy mercy upon us. Thou art our Lord supreme. Secure us then against people who deny the truth. In quick summary, God does not push us past what we could bear. So if there's something, anything that you feel inspired to do that seems like it may be impossible, know that God literally has your back. With that in mind, I'll leave you with a small action that I have made into a part of my day-to-day -day life, and that helps me amidst moments in which I feel like the world is just fighting to hold me back. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath, no matter where you may be, and just ask for God's help. I know there are so many dua and prayers out there, but the beauty of Islam lays in the fact that we quite literally have a personal connection to God, no frills or fuss attached. Sounds like an infomercial. Last thing, just as Fatima reached out to those around her in times of need, remember that you can do the same. We're all in this together, cue high school musical music. And if I can be of help with anything, know that I'm here to listen at the very least. God commands justice, doing good, and generosity towards relatives, and God forbids what is shameful, blameworthy, and oppressive. God teaches you so that you may take heed. Quran 16 verse 90. Remember, the world is ours to take, so what are we waiting for?